want to welcome all those who are visiting with us and as those who regularly join us here on Zoom at 9 a.m. We will continue to Zoom at 9 a.m. throughout this time of pandemic as our principal worship service. In the most recent weeks, we have been able to worship inside the sanctuary, but sadly, the increase in infections in Connecticut has meant that we needed to cancel for today. The reopening task force is the body that has been appointed by our congregation to monitor that situation and also to provide for safe ways for us to worship and to gather. And so they will continue to monitor the situation and let us know when it's safe to come back together again in the sanctuary. We will continue to um, keep our Christmas schedule with the outdoor worship services and the Zoom services and the pre-recorded services. And if we can, we'll gather in person as well. So stay tuned on the website and on the emails to stay informed. This is the first Sunday of Advent and we'd like for you to take a look at our newsletter where you can find a simple liturgy for lighting an Advent wreath in your home and making an Advent wreath in your home. It's underneath the tab that says what's happening. And you'll see that I'm here in the sanctuary, zooming from the sanctuary for the first time. Ben Wright and the property committee did some good work on extending our Wi-Fi into this space. So we are looking forward to augmenting our abilities to share with you worship from the sanctuary in the coming weeks and months. Thank you to all who have participated in our Encourage One Another stewardship campaign so far. We have received a number of pledges so far, and we will continue to update you regarding our emails via email. And if you need an intention of giving card, you can find it under the quick links at the homepage or reach out to our office to request one. Thank you to everyone who has participated. And finally, we invite you to place your prayer requests into the chat feature at the bottom of the screen. We will be praying them together today in our prayers of intercession. With all those things then before us, I invite you to prepare yourself for worship. We now sing our opening hymn and light the Advent wreath, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Dick, you must be muted. Thank 
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Stir up your power, Lord Christ, and come. By your merciful protection, awaken us to the threatening dangers of our sins and keep us blameless until the coming of your new day. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. It's now time for the children's sermon. So I wonder, what is the worst place for you to be waiting? Maybe a stoplight? The grocery store checkout? COVID testing line? Well, Sarah's going to show you one of my least favorite places to wait. Yes, you guessed it, the DMV. I wonder, is there any place you really enjoy waiting? Most of us don't like to wait, period, anywhere, anytime. Waiting means doing nothing, wasting time. Waiting means that someone else or some other process is in control, not us. We are not in charge when we are waiting, and we don't like it. Waiting is countercultural, and it can be hard. A lot of us, maybe all of us, are doing an awful lot of waiting right now. Waiting for a vaccine. Waiting to be back in school in person. Waiting to hug a grandchild or to see a family member face to face waiting to attend a sporting event or a concert like we used to. It isn't easy, but it is necessary to wait sometimes. Waiting can teach us patience and fortitude as we tap our inner sources of strength. But I notice that not all waiting is good. Sometimes, Waiting is simply procrastination or, or laziness. Sometimes it's resistance to necessary change. The value of waiting depends on what you are waiting for. Today is the first Sunday of Advent, and one of the themes of Advent is waiting. We are waiting for Jesus waiting not only for the celebration of his birth over 2,000 years ago, but also of his coming again to put all things to right. As we pray the old Advent prayer, 
Come, Lord Jesus. We long for the world as it should be. And we begin to imagine the world as it should be, as it will be when Jesus returns to make all things new. And as we envision this new world that Jesus is bringing into our very midst, we find that we are sustained and our hope is reborn in our waiting. In Advent, we light one candle at a time. It's a reminder that we're not in control. We are waiting. But there is one who is in control. And that one can be trusted in all things. The one who sent Jesus into the world to be light in our darkness, to sustain us in our waiting. So, what are you waiting for? This Advent, may you wait for Jesus and in him find your hope, your future, and God's kingdom. Amen. We continue now with the reading from scripture. Our reading today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as a testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Yeah, I'd like to invite you to sing along. I'm going to sing the Alleluia. Uh, I'll repeat the word Alleluia four times, and then if you'd repeat the uh, refrain, then I'll sing the verse, and then if you'd sing Hallelujah with me again, that'd be great. Pastor Brian and I would like to share a sermon that is given to us by the New England Synod, specifically from the ELCA World Hunger Team. Pastor Rhinus has been working alongside the ELCA World Hunger Appeal to promote it in our synod for years, and he has traveled to many sites that have received funding from the ELCA World Hunger Appeal. So he's going to share a gospel from last week, Matthew 25, and a sermon which features some of these projects that your dollars have been supporting. And I'd like to also share with you the thank you that we received from the Synod and from Pastor Rhinus and his wife, Doreen, that states that in 2019, our congregation gave over $2,500 to the World Hunger Appeal through your giving. So I want to extend their thanks and add my thanks for your generosity to this work that gives people the tools that they need to feed themselves 
domestically and around the world. Let us hear the gospel and sermon from Pastor Rhinus. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me, naked and you did not give me clothing, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment but the righteous into eternal life. The gospel of our Lord. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you know that we want to follow you, and sometimes we're unsure of the way. We pray, Lord, that you open our hearts today once again to your word, that we may understand your, your calling and that we may follow you. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. There's so many different ways of following Jesus. Sometimes those ways are in, in tension with one another, different calls to be uh, a certain way politically or morally or socially. There's so many different ways things can be interpreted. Wouldn't it be wonderful if Jesus could be really clear in one of his parables, showing us exactly what we need to do? I believe that this parable of Jesus in Matthew 25 is as close as we get. It's a wonderful parable about Jesus expressing exactly what he wants his people to do, what his followers need to do to show compassion to others and to share that compassion in seeing the face of Jesus in those in need. It reminds me of the uh, Micah chapter 6, verse 8, which uh, we see at, the, at Calumet, for example, in, the, in what's called the Micah room. What does the Lord require of you, O mortal? except to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. I believe Jesus is saying much the same thing in these words. My name is David Rhinus. I'm a Lutheran pastor, just having celebrated my 46 years of, of ordination. When I was in seminary in 1974, when I, the year I graduated, the ELCA, no, it wasn't ELCA, it was the LCA at that time, the Lutheran Church in America, had just initiated the World Hunger Appeal. I got excited. I thought, what a wonderful idea. What a way for a national church to be identified as in, in terms of feeding people who are hungry. I was on board with it then, and I've continued to support and encourage support for the World Hunger Appeal ever since then. The World Hunger Appeal has so many different manifestations throughout the world. You probably heard the, the dictum that if you feed, uh, if, if you if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, but if you uh, teach him how to fish, then you can feed him for a lifetime. I have a wonderful example of that. When uh, in 19, in, I'm sorry, in 2007, when we visited Tanzania, 
we were visiting there a church that had uh, 144 orphans and our congregation in, in uh, Chelmsford, Trinity Lutheran Church, was going to help with those. But we also took the opportunity to visit some sites where world hunger monies were being spent. The one that was most impressive to me was a, a kind of a way of uh, people learning to fish farm. And here is a man and a woman who were able, with a lot of work, husband and wife, with a lot of work, but not a lot of outlay of cash, which is very, very short supply in their community, to find a way of getting protein consistently for their family. It was in terms of being able to farm fish on their own property. The first thing they had to do was to dig a, a, uh, a pond that was only about uh, one meter deep at one corner and maybe about a foot deep at the opposite corner. The pond was about uh, 10 meters by 10 meters, or you might say about 30 feet by 30 feet. And in one side of the, the pond was a cage that was made by driving stakes into the, the ground, the sticks, and tying them together, making a, a little kind of a cage. And this cage was a place where they would throw their food scraps. The scraps would decompose in this area and create a kind of an algae bloom in the water. The fish that were in the pond, tilapia fish, would eat the algae and would also eat zooplankton, which were also feeding on the algae. With a very little extra food that they would give to the fish, this way allowed them to sustain those fish so that they could continue to eat them. The uh, strings that you see going across the, uh, the pond were there, uh, placed there tightly to keep away uh, birds that might be also after the delicious fish. Also, there was a second pond that this particular farmer needed to build because he was especially empowered by the World Hunger Appeal to be a farmer who would teach others to do the same thing. He was supplied with a bicycle that had a tank welded on the back of it. And in this extra pond, he would have the fry, that's the little fish, and as they would grow big enough, he would take those fish to another farmer who was also prepared to receive those fish and with, with, a, with his own pond and continue the same kind of work. What a wonderful way of feeding their own family. What a wonderful way of supplying food so they could even sell some of the fish and supply other needs for the family. Now, many people often wonder about the world hunger appeal and say, we also have people within the United States who are also hungry, and shouldn't we also be taking care of them? Well, that's one of the things that's wonderful about the world hunger appeal. Sometimes we forget that the United States of America is a part of the world, and the world hunger appeal serves people all over the world, including the United States. As a matter of fact, about 30% of the contributions that you give to the world hunger appeal are spent domestically here in the United States. There are two kinds of programs, and I want to mention both of them. The first is a large grant that's uh, up to $10,000 a year over a three-year period. And these are for uh, congregations in uh, communities where they have a, a, a large program that needs special funding. One such program is here in East Boston, and I visited it. It's the uh, East Boston Community Soup Kitchen. I visited there, and at one of the anniversary celebrations, I got this great t-shirt. This church, this, um, this program meets in the basement of Our Savior's Lutheran Church, and they, they serve a meal for whoever comes in the door uh, every Tuesday. And it's not just a place for people to eat. It's a place that is community for people. They can, they can uh, eat together, laugh together, console each other together. And they also uh, can, can take home groceries so that they're able to feed their families for the rest of the week. There's also counseling for housing and for various types of addiction. That people can overcome many of the problems that have left us, that have left them in those difficult circumstances. That's one of the programs and it's a large program and not too many of them are granted because they, they're, um, they're granted all over the country. We're fortunate to have two of those right now in New England. Another group program is called Daily Bread, and these offer smaller grants to congregations 
were able to raise $500 of their own funding. Then the ELCA through this grant matches that $500, so it becomes $1,000. One of these programs is in uh, First Lutheran Church in New Britain, Connecticut. And there, because of the, uh, the pandemic, the coronavirus that we're all so unfortunately familiar with, they had a feeding program that was feeding people uh, during uh, once a week, and it became more difficult to sustain that program during this pandemic. So in working with local vendors, they're able to, they're able to now purchase pizzas that are brought to the church in the back of a pickup truck, and then it's uh, wrapped in foil, and people who are hungry and who come to the church are given this, this pizza at the meal. They also have the opportunity to get uh, bread from a local bakery, and also sometimes they're able to take flowers home. It's a program that not only feeds the people, but gives them dignity, gives them a place where they can be together, where they can be fed not just on that day, but also can be fed during the week. Now, in the gospel lesson, Jesus is almost asking us to see his face in the people who are hungry, who are thirsty, who are strangers, who are sick, or who are in prison. I had an experience with that through my daughter, who many years ago was on a Habitat for Humanity build in Zambia. And I remember when she said she was going, she said, Daddy, I have to take a hammer. What kind would you recommend? And I said, well, what will you be doing with it? She said, well, we're building a school out of cinder blocks. And first we have to smash the rocks to make the gravel so that we can make the cinder blocks. So I sent her with a sledgehammer and I said, you don't need to bring it back. So she went there and the group was when a, uh, was uh, eating and sleeping in a kind of a, like a youth hostel. And they had a dormitory and there was also a room where they took their meals. And each evening at the end of the meal, the, uh, the guests, my daughter and the other people from Habitat would as polite guests would scrape off the leftovers from their plates into another plate and, uh, and then stack the dishes with the, the leftover food at the top. And each night the staff would come out of the kitchen and say, no, 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 you don't have to do that. We'll take care of that. We'll take care of that. And, uh, but they continued to do it because they wanted to be polite. Well, one evening my daughter lingered and she was talking to somebody or looking at something on the some posters on the wall. And she saw the staff come back out of the kitchen and take the leftover food and redistribute it into those plates. Then the staff sat down and ate the food. Then when they were finished, they took any leftover food that they now didn't want and threw it out the window. The next morning, the children from the neighborhood, a nearby village, came under the window and ate the scraps of food that were there. My daughter had permission to take a photo of one of the children. Jesus tells us that when we feed the hungry, when we give something to drink to the thirsty, we are doing it as unto him. They are do, they are, we are feeding and giving drink to the least of those. Is it like seeing the face of Jesus in children, in those who are the least? Amen.
Let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostle or the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begin, begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, True God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. God of power and might, tear open the heavens and come quickly to this weary world. Hear our prayers for everyone in need. Each petition will end with the words, Hear us, O God, to which the congregation may respond, Your mercy is great. We pray for this planet in need of restoration for devastated habitats, polluted waters, thawing ice, blazing fires, swelling floods, and long-lasting droughts. Renew the face of the earth in our relationship to it. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We pray for all people who care for others in our community and around the world. Fill them with compassion and the power to respond with justice for those who are oppressed, with welcome for those who are excluded, and with relief for those who suffer. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. We pray for people who are in crisis as the seasons change, for those without homes facing severe weather, 
for those who are unemployed or underemployed, and for those in poverty or facing food insecurity. We pray especially for our partner ministries funded by the ELCA World Hunger Appeal. Relieve their burdens, sustain their bodies, and ease their minds. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We pray for the people in our families and congregation who live with depression, anxiety, chronic pain, addiction, and other invisible illnesses. Be with all affected by COVID-19, including caregivers and health professionals. Ease suffering and support whom we now name. We pray for Carolyn and family, Dorothy Jensen, Michelle, Brad, Robin, Jill, Teresa Rajinsky for the loss of her mother, Senta and Cliff Broder, Fred and Ann's son-in-law, Isaac, Rick Crompagel, uh, grandson-in-law, Isaac from Fred and Ann, and for the family of Ruth Bedson, who shared in her memorial service yesterday at St. Matthew, and for Rick, who is in hospice care. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We give thanks for the lives and witness of those who died while waiting for justice, peace, or healing. Those whose names we know and those who names are known only to you. Sustain all who still yearn for the completion of your redeeming work. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Draw near us, O God, and receive our prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The creator of the stars, bless your advent waiting. The long-expected Savior fill you with love. The unexpected Spirit guide your journey, now and forever. Amen. We now sing our sending hymn, Joy to the World. And... We invite you to sing along with verses one, two, and four, as the choir has a special arrangement for verse three.
Go in peace. Prepare the way of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, to, be God. to God. Thank you everyone for joining for our worship service today. We'd invite you to share a sign of peace with others before you leave today. You can click the wave icon or give a wave or a peace sign or message someone in the group through the chat. Those who'd like to stick around for the breakout groups, I invite you to visit with one another and greet each other. And perhaps you'd also like to entertain, entertain both or one of these questions. When did you wait for something that was worth waiting for? And what are you waiting for now? God's peace to all of you.